Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the PSG Think Big series live. It's the first time that we're hosting this session as a hybrid event. So thank you all for joining us, whether you're joining us in the room or online this morning. It's an absolute pleasure hosting you as we bring you independent insights on some of our country's most pressing issues that hopefully in turn give you the opportunity to bounce off them and help formulate your own. I'm Alicia Seckham, and what an honor it is to have Reserve Bank Governor Lesetja Kanyako sitting next to me this morning. Governor, a very warm welcome to you. Thanks so much for your time. What a time to be a central banker, I guess, no matter where in the world you're sitting right now. And what a time for us to be having this conversation and this engagement uh, as the higher for longer rates message really starts to sink in. Uh, I, I hope so. Uh, it seems to be reflected uh, eventually in the prices in the market. Um, uh, inflation has proved to be more persistent than central bankers around the world uh, initially thought, uh, at least as far as the advanced economies are concerned. Uh, emerging markets uh, had moved earlier. Uh, yeah. In particular, the Latin Americans uh, started moving rates from as early as April 2021. South African Reserve Bank only started in November uh, 2021. And uh, inflation, even after we were adjusting rates, inflation kept on climbing and it actually only peaked in July last year and uh, started to decline. But even the declines were very minuscule. It's only in the most recent three recent prints that uh, we saw inflation decline significantly and falling back within the inflation target. And uh, at 4.7, 4.8, it's fairly close to the midpoint of our inflation target. Range. Absolutely. And we're going to, over the next hour, be delving into some of the complexities you're coming up against as a result of the uh, you know, macroeconomic context, both locally and globally, and how that in turn is influencing South Africa's monetary policy. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be an opportunity for you to get involved in the conversation as well, and that in the final 15 minutes of this session, we will have a roving microphone doing the round. So if you do have a question for the governor when the time comes, please indicate by show of hand, and that mic will find its way into your hands for you to pose your question directly. For those of you who are joining us online this morning, uh, feel free to pop any questions you might have into the chat box and those will be filtered through um, to me to pose on your behalf. I know it's going to be a, gov a busy one, Governor, because pre this session on registration, we had about 100 questions <laughs> being filtered through already. So I'm going to get straight into it without any further ado, right? No guesses where we're going to start. We've had court papers argue that the Saab's conclusion that the president did not have an obligation to report Forex paid to and stolen from his Palapala farm was irrational. The decision has cast a bit of a blemish on the Saab as a beacon of independence and stability. Why shouldn't the conclusion you came to rattle what has been a long guarded status? For starters, uh, uh, as the governor, and the, my colleagues, the deputy governors, we do not get involved in the investigations. We leave that with the career uh, central bankers. Um, they are expected to act independently, without fear, favor, or prejudice. We expect nothing less uh, from them. We have got no reason to second guess them. They had arrived at their conclusion. We have availed the resources they needed to do the uh, investigation and we are not going to second guess them. The report itself has not been uh, released because by law we couldn't release that report. Um, but now there are court papers that had been served which would call for our record of decisions and those documents would be available uh, for the courts. Um, the tissues will be ventilated uh, in the court till then we have no further comments. Okay, let's distill it perhaps this way because a lot of the commentary, Governor, has been to say that no transaction took place 
Therefore, from the Reserve Bank's perspective, there's nothing to investigate is not good enough, right? So I want to look at it from this perspective. What are the implications for an individual in South Africa conducting business in foreign currency, in cash, without Saab oversight of those transfers? And are the implications the same for the country's president? The, the country's president, when he took an oath, he said that he will abide by the constitution and the laws of the country. That is what uh, is, uh, uh, is expected. With respect to the trade uh, in currency, there are important things to distinguish here. Firstly, the cash that comes into the country has to be declared at the point of entry. Mm -hmm. That is a customs matter. It's not a reserve bank matter. South African Revenue Services investigated that, and they have pronounced on, uh, on that. That is not for the Reserve Bank. Secondly, when a South African enters into a transaction with a foreigner where they are selling to a foreigner, the regulations are very clear. The invoicing has got to take place in foreign currency, not in the South African rent. There are processes through which once that has been done and the transaction has taken place, that there would be a declaration. The Reserve Bank investigation focused on only that component mm -hmm. of the regulations. My investigators have reached a conclusion. That conclusion is what stands. We understand that there are people who are unhappy who have decided to take it to the court. When we are in court, we will ventilate it there. My investigators will file a replying affidavit and these things will be contested uh, in court. The court is the final arbiter about whether the laws have been interpreted correctly or not. So there will be no point in me trying to then say what I think the court should be. I, we have gone through this investigation, we have gone through so many legal opinions, and um, I have got no doubt that the advice that we have taken was the best advice that we could get, and those things will be ventilated by the lawyers in court. And you've gone through this investigation without any political meddling? My politicians uh, cannot come into the Reserve Bank on any of the matters that we are uh, busy with, we have made it very clear that we are acting independently, without fear, favor, or prejudice. The investigation that had taken place, with the, that is what every South African would have been subjected, uh, subjected to. Okay, matter to bed. Of course, you've defended the independence of the Saab for the longest while. It's backed by the, inst uh, the Constitution. Still, I've got to ask you, how seriously is that independence being tested right now? And if I'm to be blunt about it, to what degree is the ANC applying pressure on the Saab to change any of its mandates? Um, the mandate is in the Constitution. So the Constitution was written by duly elected representatives of our people. And if anybody wants to uh, change the mandate of the Reserve Bank, they will have to change the Constitution. Mm -hmm. it's, as, it's as simple as that. As it stands, we have got the independence, we have got the mandate, we will act uh, uh, on the basis of that. The independence had been tested repeatedly, repeatedly. Um, and it is not just uh, from the political parties. You know that the Office of the Public Protector also tried uh, to amend the Constitution, um, uh, but they didn't have the power to uh, to do so, and um, uh, are we under pressure from any of the political parties? Well, if they want to do it, they probably might be saying it elsewhere. None of the political parties came to engage us and said that we think your independence must go, but even if they were to come and say our independence must go, we will tell them, go change the constitution. If it is with respect to the mandate, there was a reason why uh, uh, our mandate was written in the manner it is yeah. written and for the benefit of the attendees here 
it says that we must protect the value of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable. And I mean, you've said this over and over again, right, Governor? Uh, yes, either, either, either my English <laughs> is not very good or, 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 or that uh, people decide not I'm to... the conduit for the questions being asked still, despite this uh, repetitive commentary that you've been given uh, to the markets. I mean, you've said before, while the fight is for a new mandate... Uh, when it comes to in the inflation mandate centered on the socio-economic well-being of its citizens, you've said inflation targeting is, in fact, meant to improve the economic well-being of the citizens of a country. So make that make sense for those who are feeling the impact of a rising interest rate environment uh, and how it's impacting their disposable income, because it's been a hard and a bitter pill to swallow 10 times now. So what are the benefits of keeping inflation within the particular inflation rate? Any development strategy that does not promote price stability is by definition anti-poor because the poor feel the ravages of inflation more than any other income group. Statistics South Africa publishes the headline inflation as we know it and they also publish inflation per decile. If you take the incomes that South Africans earn and you divide them into deciles, the two bottom deciles with being decile one and decile two. Inflation was 4.8% in August. Those deciles are experiencing inflation of just over 9%, about 9.4%. The top income earners, that is decile nine and 10, experience inflation of 4.3%. You get the gist. Yeah. Who is hurt the most? The poor. So if anybody says that we must stop paying attention to inflation. They are telling us that we must stop paying attention to the poor because the poor feel the inflation uh, the, uh, the most. So now you will then say that, well, um, high interest rates and then it reduces people's disposable income. No. What reduces people's disposable income is inflation because you see, people are now paying more for the same goods and services that they were consuming the year before. They are paying more. And because of that, their disposable income uh, is reduced. It is because inflation is reducing the disposable income of people that the central bank has to step in to cap inflation. And unfortunately, the capping of inflation involves us having to deploy interest rates. And as we deploy interest rates, uh, people feel pain. The medicine is not nice. It's a, it's a bitter medicine. But if the patient does not take this medicine now, if the patient does not take the medicine now, this patient might end up in the ICU. Yeah. And we don't know whether they will come out of the ICU. Is the inflation band pegged between 3 and 6 percent still appropriate in the current context? And I ask the question because it has been moved before. It's not an immovable band that mm -hmm. stands there. Bottom line, is that appropriate? Are you not trying to fight state failure where higher interest rates is the price, Governor, of state failure on so many fronts as it feeds into cost and the inflationary scenario? Uh, the, the concept of state failure should not be used loosely. The South African Reserve Bank is part of the state, and we have not failed. So, so when you talk about state failure, you must tell us where, which part of the state is failing. It's a long list, right? Uh, when uh, we disagree with each other and you do not like our report, where do you run to? To the courts. Are the courts a failure? No, the courts are not a failure. So there might be parts of the state, or there are parts of the state that are not functioning, uh, but the term concept of state failure should not be used loosely. We must be careful how, uh, how it is used. But is the Reserve Bank compensating for state failure through interest rates? No. We are dealing with uh, inflation, and this inflation that we are faced with, and 
like it becomes a very interesting thing, Alicia, because you're saying in this, because some people have said to us, but this inflation uh, comes from somewhere else. Uh, you are not going to succeed in, uh, doing, uh, in doing this. Well, inflation peaked at 7.8% last year. It is now at 4.8%. Mm -hmm. Something brought it down. <laughs> Okay, we get your point. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that for now, but I'm going to circle back at some point in the conversation, right? Let's take a look at impact on the currency. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen a positive impact on the value of the rand with the dollar obviously running rampant. And so we've got this double whammy that we're having to contend with of higher interest rates and a weak currency. Governor, are you worried? Um, I worry about inflation. Um, uh, the uh, exchange rate is not one of the variables the central bank uh, 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 controls. But even as inflation has come down, we have made it clear that there are risks mm -hmm. to the inflation outlook. And amongst the risks we have identified has been the oil price, food prices, and uh, possibility of an El Nino effect. The exchange rate is one that we have also mentioned. So we worry about the currency to the extent that it ends up feeding into, uh, into inflation. And that is how we would, uh, we, would think, uh, we would think about it. Now, the um, global financial conditions have tightened. Mm. Um, okay. Put simply, interest rates globally have gone up. And the indication are that interest rates globally are going to remain high for longer. What that means is there is going to be a realignment of exchange rates. Yeah. And we have seen, uh, seen this week, uh, uh, the pound is at its weakest against uh, the dollar since whenever. Oh, the rent is... Uh, so weak compared to 20, uh, it's as weak as it was in 2020. Um, uh, the euro is this weak against the dollar, and the, there is a realignment of exchange rates. Can and I the nudge rent, you, Gavin? The rent, the rent is no exception to that realignment. Can I nudge you, and I'm going to try my luck here, into offering your opinion on a fair dollar rand exchange rate? Oh, a fair dollar uh, exchange rate. Oh no, that's uh, that's uh, that's the simplest of the uh, of the questions. A fair dollar ex uh, uh, exchange rate, dollar rent exchange rate, uh, is the one that is determined by forces of demand and supply in the foreign exchange market. I told you, I was trying my luck. We had to give it a go, right? Look. <laughs> Bottom line, when it comes down to it, local woes aside, external forces, like you say, very strong, Governor. The Fed said it's going to be keeping rates higher for longer than previously anticipated, so much so that we're looking at a possible interest rate hike this year. We're looking at uh, fewer cuts than anticipated for 2024. On our end of the world, right here in South Africa, we may have seen some reprieve, but all it would have taken was one person in the last MPC sitting to swing things the other way and we would have seen a hike as well so where the world is asking is the u.s ready for interest rates at seven percent is south africa ready for interest rates at ten percent um we have seen worse we have seen interest rates at 26 percent before i don't think we will ever uh, go there uh, at least uh, whilst you have the central bank that has been given this responsibility that uh, uh, that it has and um uh, one can't say where the thing stops. What you should be watching is what happens to inflation. Because the only thing that makes central banks to increase interest rates is because inflation has gone up. So now, just across the Atlantic, the southern part of uh, the Americas, uh, there is a country with uh, uh, inflation of uh, about 100% or so. Uh, their interest rates are definitely not 8.25. And north of here, just across the Limpopo, is another country with inflation in the, in the 90s. Their interest rates are nowhere close to 8.25.
get the gist. Yeah. The higher the inflation, the higher the interest rate. Mm. The countries that are having low interest rates at the moment are countries that are experiencing low inflation. What does that higher interest rate scenario do for South Africa, Governor, from a growth perspective? I mean, what kind of stress from a growth perspective mm -hmm. are you warning against? There is no country that grows sustainably because it has got high inflation. I can't find one. There, there are countries that are, uh, might not be growing mm -hmm. and also be having low inflation, but I can't find one which is growing sustainably, and it has got uh, high inflation. Ask the Zimbabweans, ask the Turkish, ask the Argentinians, ask the Ghanaians, ask the Angolans, ask the Mozambicans what high inflation bought them. Yeah. It didn't buy them growth. It didn't. And, um, and that, is what, uh, that is what you face. And that is why the authors of our constitution said protect the value of the currency in the interest of balance and sustainable growth. They understood that price stability is a precondition for balance and sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. But they also understood that price stability is a necessary condition for balance and sustainable growth, but it is by no means, it is by no means a sufficient uh, condition. And yet you've been asked time and time again, like we've discussed uh, and alluded to, to broaden your mandate with a focus on growth, with a focus on employment. We've, you've been asked to get creative uh, with the tools, right? Do you even have the right tools at your disposal, Governor, that could be used directly to address growth and unemployment challenges? The, the day we have creative central bankers, you must get worried. <laughs> um, uh, central bankers have got to be predictable, and transparent mm -hmm. and, uh, and not a middle into this uh, into this. Central banks have been designed for a purpose and uh, we have been given price stability mandate and we have been given the tools to execute that mandate. We have been given a financial stability mandate and we have been given the tools to pursue financial stability and we Amongst those is functioning financial markets, and we have got a role in the functioning of financial markets, and if we see stresses in financial markets, we step in, and in 2020, when financial markets were not functioning, we stepped in with our bond purchase program and got the financial markets to work. If you say you are giving us an employment mandate, you must give us the tools to create employment. And where are those tools now and who are they with? Mm. If you do that, you must also give us a say on the functioning of the labor markets, which we do not have a say in. Labor markets is the preserve of the Minister of Labor with the unions and with the uh, uh, businesses. Contested area requires political judgment, and I do not think that central bankers uh, are uh, equipped with the tools to make political And judgments. I was going to say, it starts taking you into dangerous, dangerous territory, right? Because there are perils with the broadening of this mandate as well, because it could well trigger quite severe trade-offs between then developmental and stabilization objectives. Well, developmental, once again, if your developmental strategy is high inflation, you do not have a developmental strategy. Mm because you are telling us you are against the poor. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Amidst it all, let's take a look at the conversation being had around the BRICS nations to create a common currency for trade and investment between each other, and this as a means, of course, to reduce the vulnerability that we're exposed to as far as the dollar uh, exchange rate fluctuations are concerned. Considering the economic, the political, and the geographic disparities, Governor, between the member states here, is it feasible? Or would this be more a political project as well? Uh, the euro was a political project too, and so is the proposal mm -hmm. of an African uh, currency. It's a political project too. And so if there is a political project to create a BRICS country, well, let the people who take those decisions 
uh, make those decisions. Um, but what would it take uh, to have a BRICS currency? For starters, it must have an issuer. So there must be a BRICS central bank mm. right there. And I do not want to get into the politics of it, but a decision will have to be made. Where is this central bank going to be located? And then there's going to be contestation. That's, that is one. Two, you can't have one currency and five fiscal policies. I'm just using the current yeah. BRICS number of the five that are there. You can't have five fiscal policies. You'll have to have a common fiscal policy. Otherwise, you do not have a, a single a currency. Three, the lessons from Europe is that you need a banking union. So you will have to have a banking union and common regulation of banks in the BRICS countries. Uh, you get the gist. So, so you, not feasible. Um, I didn't say it's not feasible. If you can do all of those things and have a common inflation rate, then you are talking, you are having a uh, currency. But then somebody must make the case here uh, for it. You say that given the volatility with the US, who said that that currency will be less volatile? Currencies are all volatile. They, it will be as volatile as the other currencies uh, are. It might actually even be more volatile given that it has got five fiscal policies and um, uh, five banking legislations and all, of, uh, and all of that. But the question that should be asked is, what ill are we trying to cure mm -hmm. with a BRICS? Uh, as central banks in the BRICS member countries, we felt that trade must be facilitated. And when trade is facilitated, there must be settlement, and settlement needs currencies. And what we have been working on in the BRICS uh, central banks is the interconnectedness and interoperability of our national payment systems so that settlement can be easy across the border. That will be more useful uh, than talking of a, 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 a BRICS currency. What is currently happening? So in Johannesburg here, we have got an RMB clearing uh, center. Um, so Chinese companies, South African companies, can settle with each other using either rent or RMBs. And if they run short of rent or RMBs, there are swap lines between the People's Bank of China and the South African Reserve Bank. We do not need a BRICS currency. They, we can settle with RMB and with RAND. Uh, but as I had said, the euro was a political project. If this is a political project, well, political decisions must be uh, taken and uh, uh, let it be. But I, as all that I am saying is that what matters is uh, the trade. And we are saying that central banks are capable of facilitating that trade. And like we've emphasized, there is so much, Governor, that falls outside the remit of the Reserve Bank, right? Um, and I told you that we were going to circle back to this point. At some point, I wanted to let the issue ventilate and breathe a bit. The efficient use of capital, driving implementation of economic policy, stricter procurement policy, um, a reduction of wasteful expenditure, getting a handle on corruption, mm in the country. I mean, these are all issues that, as I say, fall outside of the remit of the central bank, and we acknowledge that, right? But the central bank is drawn into the arguments nevertheless, with South Africans having to pay for government deficits, inefficiencies, leaking buckets, wasteful expenditure, squandering. You've issued yourself a warning to the ANC saying that deteriorating fiscal risks will lead to higher interest rates. There's been a speculation over a fallout of the uh, proposed cost containment measures that are being uh, tabled. Where are your confidence levels sitting, Governor, when it comes to getting a handle on fiscal recklessness, considering that we're heading into an election here? I have not spoken to the ANC. But you've and issued a warning, I've right? I've not spoken to the ANC, and uh, I, uh, the central bank is not in the business of giving warnings to political parties. What we said is the fiscal stance 
influences the country risk premium. For us, as in setting interest rates, we, you were asking, talking about the interest rates uh, being high. There is a measure that we use to see whether interest rates are high or low. We call it the neutral real interest rate. When interest rates are above neutral real interest rate, we say that monetary policy is restrictive. If it is below the neutral real rate, we say it is accommodative. Mm -hmm. In that neutral real rate, you have foreign interest rate, and for South Africa, the more important bit is the country risk premium. That country risk premium is driven by fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. And so, if South Africa is to have lower neutral interest rate, you need fiscal policy to be able to bring down the country risk premium. That's where we end as a, the central bank. How the government spends its money, that is not where we come from. You might just be, happen to be uh, 12 years late. If you asked me that question 12 years ago, I was the Director General of the Treasury, I would have answered it for you. I did caveat it with so much falling outside the remit of the central bank, right? But, okay, let me just get, a, get your view, an opinion. You mm -hmm. have those, Governor. What do you see as South Africa's key economic constraints? Key constraints are structural, and we have spelled this out uh, before. Post the pandemic, the world was opening up. Iron ore prices shot up, coal prices shot up, and so, so the bulk commodities. South African mining houses were very profitable, but we just couldn't get the iron ore there. Mm. We didn't, couldn't get the coal there. There are problems in our national logistics system. You just have to be on the N3 and see the amount of trucks uh, that are putting pressure on the roads. See that. And uh, I hope there is a backup generator here uh, <laughs> because um, without energy, you can't fuel yeah. a modern economy. And so the electricity constraint uh, is binding uh, for us. Alicia, you can go and compare South Africa, uh, what we spend on uh, education compared to other countries and look at our education outcomes. No amount of screaming at the central bank is going to improve the education outcomes yeah. because we just do not have the tools uh, to, to do that. And those are the concerns. And the, the thing about the education outcomes becomes so important. Yesterday, one of the newspapers, I don't want to advertise it, uh, ran with a story about uh, some audit firm that talked about South African minerals running out in a certain number of years. Of course, at some point, the minerals will run out. What the article didn't say, the message that said, we are in trouble, that we are going to run out of minerals. But the biggest wealth of a country, of a modern economy today, is not the mineral wealth underneath the ground. That is not the real wealth of the country. The real wealth of the country is that which is in the heads of its citizens, mm -hmm. is the know-how. And that is where we should actually be focusing, creating know-how, because that is how countries grow and that's how countries compete. Absolutely. And I mean, that message has to be, uh, you know, shouted out loudly, Governor. We had Busi Mabuso in her weekly letter a couple of weeks ago saying uh, government basically has two options at this point, cut back spending or induce a financial crisis. We've had concerns about the country's fiscal outlook and, you know, what we aren't or are, are or aren't doing to get ourselves out of this rat uh, focused on by foreign investors. Uh, you know, they're worried. We've had bond yields widen. We've had the RAND weaken. Uh, and many saying that the situation would have been a lot worse 
had we not seen interest rates sitting at these high rates that we have at, what, 14-year highs, right? Are you simply going to have to be comfortable being Mr. Bad Guy for a while yet? I think we are Mr. Good Guy. We are bringing <laughs> down inflation. Um, so um, I don't know. I mean, I say to uh, some of my, uh, my staff, and I say that, uh, you know, just check. Ask the question. Where were interest rates in 1998 in South Africa? 25.5 was the repo in 1998. And uh, for those who uh, lived in the 80s <laughs> would know that interest rates in the 80s were at some 22%. Inflation was at about 80 or so. And so interest rates go up and come down as inflation goes up and inflation comes down. The experience of South Africa has been since 1994, every time interest rates peak, they peak at a lower level than the previous one. Um, at, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2008, interest rates went all the way up. They went into double digits. We had the repo rate in double digits. Yeah. Uh, so when we say high, we say high relative to what? And, and again, we believe that where interest rates are is consistent with the inflation trajectory that we have. Uh, barring the risks that we have talked about materializing, this is an appropriate monetary policy stance. And it's interesting because while you say that's the question people should be asking, a repeated question that came through uh, you know, on that list of 100 questions from viewers was, Governor, when can we expect to see interest rates come down considering that consumer spend makes up 64% of the Oh, no, that's not a very difficult <laughs> question. And when once, we've got a handle on inflation. <laughs> once we have lo uh, inflation low and consistently low, you will see lower interest rates. There will be no reason to keep interest rates high if inflation has declined. What needs to happen holistically for that scenario to play itself out? Um, when you say holistically? Look, okay. because okay, let's got, start, it's let not me just help. local, let right? Me help. Let me help. So holistically? So let's take that inflation basket. Let's take that inflation basket and see uh, what else is rising there and whether there's anything that we can do with it. There is a component called administered prices mm -hmm. in that. Uh, that component has consistently been rising faster than uh, the inflation rate. And you know what? Who says that means that prices? Government, of course. That means that we can arrest inflation if the price setters in government set the price of their prices, price increases, consistent with the inflation, uh, the inflation target. Amongst those, let us not talk about water, I talk about electricity, but there's also something naughty central, uh, local governments do. You play around with your, uh, your rates and taxes, mm. and then uh, they say to you, we are increasing rates by 5%. Uh, he says, okay, 5%, I can live with 5%. And then they go and they revalue your house and say that your house is now worth this much, and you end up paying more anyway. Okay? So, so and then you look at these things and say that, how could anyone justify revaluing my house by 10, 20% when the inflation rate is at 4.8%. I mean, at that rate, I will say you can come and buy the house from me. I, I would be quite happy to sell my house at 20% uh, more, but the truth of the matter is that is not what we see with the housing market. So municipalities 
yeah. are actually making the situation difficult. Which again points to those structural challenges you spoke about, speaks to how government is managing this economy. How are you in this context, Governor, reassuring the investors that you have conversations with on a daily basis as they raise concerns about their exposure to this context, to South Africa, factoring in the various shades of gray, you know, from gray listing to blackouts that we're having to contend with and asking what is South Africa doing to fight the challenges? So when they ask you, is South Africa still a good investment offering value, what distinguishes us now from the rest? Um, we, we are a vibrant democracy, and uh, I can tell you that, or maybe could even say we are a noisy democracy. Uh, uh, in spite of what you're saying, we still have institutions that are working, uh, we are still uh, home to world-class uh, companies, and uh, we are a, a, an investment value uh, proposition. But, you know, you, you talked about this thing, and then you talked about uh, grey listing. and Grey listing, of course we will get out of the grey listing. It's, it's within our control. It is within our control to get out of the grey listing. We will get out of grey listing. The only thing that will keep us there is us deciding to do nothing because maybe we don't want to come out of it. Mm. But we will come out of the grey listing. Blackouts, I'm sure that term doesn't exist in South Africa. South Africa load sheds, it doesn't, it doesn't black Listen, out. Listen, I was using the analogy, <laughs> the color spectrum here. Right? <laughs> that load shedding itself is used to try and avoid a blackout. Okay? Uh, so this Swiss friend of mine said he was working on a project in South Africa. And then he says, no, this thing can't be done. And he says that, uh, uh, no, we will not be able to do this thing. And he says that these chaps from South Africans, they come and says that, don't worry, we will make a plan. And then the project proceeds. And then we, we've got this constraint. This is not going to work. We, are, we will have to can the project. Say, don't worry, we will make a plan. And then, and then eventually the project got uh, executed. And you know what? What has been driving investment now in South Africa has been investment in embedded generation and yeah. in, that is what has been driving investment. We will get at these things and guess what? As we think that there's more generation coming up and then we discover another thing. We might be running out of transmission capacity. Uh, but again, I'm sure we will make a plan. Right? Um, so, so these challenges are not insurmountable. Last week, one of these weekly publications ran a story of executives who said, if there is something that can be done to save uh, uh, the country, and, and they had all sorts of ideas, solve this, solve that, solve that. Um, I just liked one. I liked one proposal. What was that? Stop talking and do things. Exactly. As you say that, I've literally <laughs> written down here, we need robust conversations, but that actually translate into action. Governor, how robust do your conversations get within government circles? And I know I'm possibly stepping into a trap here. I know it's not in your purview, but you've got views. Does your input go beyond just having a view? And does it translate into proposed actionable plans? Um, in our space, we do take uh, uh, actionable plans. We have actionable plans, and we execute them. You might not like what we do, but the plan is executed. Outside of your control parameters. This is, this is exactly where I, I, I am getting to. Um, we do not even express an opinion about uh, the others and what they should do. Uh, the only chaps who hear from us will be the chaps in the treasury, because the constitution says we must work uh, uh, together. Um, uh, but even then, we only talk with them to the extent that what they do impact, uh, impact our work. And, um, and there is a very good reason why we do not tell the Minister of Water Affairs uh, uh, 
what to do with the water situation. Because we don't want him to tell us what to do with inflation. Because we know what to do. <laughs> Got you. Clear lines, clear boundaries. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be opening up this conversation now to you, the audience. So if you do have a question here with us in the room, please indicate by show of hand and the mic will find its way to you. Online, please keep those con uh, questions coming through as well and those will be filtered through to me um, to pose on your behalf to any questions at this point from the audience. We've got, there we go. Morning, Governor. Is the monetary policy response function influenced by the volatility of inflation at all? One could argue that inflation globally could be more volatile in future than it has been in the past two decades. Yeah, um, it's very clear that the inflation dynamics are not what they used to be. And this poses a challenge for, uh, for central bankers. Given the steps that had been taken by the central banks so far, one would have expected that inflation would be significantly lower than what it is now. And I think all, all central banks acknowledge that, which is why they are talking of interest rates being higher for longer. As a central bank, we avoid responding to monthly readings and focus on the forecast horizon. So last month's inflation means nothing for us. There is nothing we can do about it. It's, it's, it's gone. It's in the past. It does serve as an indicator, though, because it tells us whether previous policy action taken is starting to filter through or not. And so inflation is coming down. We would like to focus on what inflation is in the future. And thus, we monitor the expectations of price setters going forward. But the South African experience shows that when you ask South Africans what they think inflation is going to be in the future, they look at the most recent inflation reading. So inflation expectations in South Africa are backward looking, looking uh, mainly for business people and for uh, trade unions. The difference had been the analyst community. The analyst community looks forward and they would tend to be in the ballpark of where the Reserve Bank thinks inflation is going to be, but the analysts are not the price setters. What matters is what the price setters actually do and thus uh, expect. And so, um, we, inflation has been persistent, it has been sticky. I wouldn't say it is going to be volatile, uh, but inflation might remain high for a longer period than we actually think, uh, and which is why central banks are cautious and are saying that uh, too early to adjust the policy rates, keep them higher for longer, let us see whether this inflation uh, declines. And in the case of the US, uh, the Fed has actually even went further and said, um, uh, don't rule out further interest rate increases. Yeah, Lucy, question answered. There's a question at, well, quite a few here. So we'll move front to back. Or middle. <laughs> there we go. Governor, considering the impact of monetary tightening in advanced economies on developing countries, exacerbating currency volatility and inequality, um, should advanced economies perhaps relax their 2% inflation target and assume a wider stabilizing role? I, you know, central bankers uh, uh, do not run out of advice. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 trust me, uh, I've got 60 million advisors. Um, uh, in South Africa. Um, 
that doesn't seem to be talk of having a higher inflation target uh, in the advanced economies. Um, but it's a conversation they should have, uh, whether the 2% is uh, uh, still adequate uh, uh, for them. Um, the time to take the target higher is not when inflation is higher than your target. Because when you do that, the price setters will expect that you are going to do it again. And so um, if the advanced economies were to revise their inflation targets higher, this is not the time uh, to do it. Uh, when their inflation, okay, the inflation in the US now is uh, around four, uh, and, um, and in the UK is like seven, eight percent uh, or so, uh, they can't even talk of having a higher inflation target because it will, it will destroy their inflation fighting, fighting uh, 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 credentials. Um, but when you said relax, why is your relaxation only on the upside and not on the lower side, as if higher inflation is better than low inflation? Do you want to? Um, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are we offering a rebuttal here now? Let's go. Uh, Governor, due to the uh, effect of the commission that found the, the state capture, why has nobody been convicted and none of the funds have been recovered due to the fact that the government is missing billions? Mm. Um, I can tell you uh, now, um, okay, we do not comment on our things, but uh, I won't say who, but uh, from the sub side, we have been able to seize, uh, freeze some monies of some companies. Cannot say, uh, cannot say which ones. Freeze assets. Cannot say which ones. The day the president or the governor of the Reserve Bank says to you, "We are going to put these people in jail." you must get worried because that's the collapse of law and order because neither the president nor the governor have the power to put anybody in jail it is the prosecuting authorities that must do that so if the prosecuting authorities says that we are going to put you in jail then you will know that that is uh, the case they mean business but if a politician says that we are going to put somebody in jail just look at them and say using what power Okay, I know that we've got a question there, oh, at the back as well. We'll get to you next. Um, before I tackle these two questions that are popping up, uh, one that's emerged, how do you protect the currency with the volume of imports associated with the climate-related transition? Um, again, um, this thing of protecting the currency gets uh, um, confused. Part of it is that the Reserve Bank itself used to cause that confusion because in the 80s, the Reserve Bank used to say we protect the external and internal value of the rent. And the internal value of the rent was defined as inflation and the external value of the rent was a, 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 the exchange rate. Yeah. The authors of the Constitution, when they wrote the thing, um, decided, no, you must just protect the value of the currency, period. There's no distinction between internal and external. And I guess that question, talking about, against uh, import, is suggesting that we protect the exchange rate. That is not where we play. The exchange rate is not one of the variables we control as a central bank. And same answer applies to this then. The prognosis for the RAND looks bleak. Is the Saab going to keep interest rates high in an attempt to attract investment flows? Um, you know, two important points. Firstly is that it's a futile exercise trying yeah. to defend uh, uh, the exchange rate. Um, South Africa paid very high school fees in 1998, very high school fees. $26 billion is what we spent trying to defend the currency ask what we could have done with $26 billion. That's what we blew yeah. at trying to defend the currency in 1998. Secondly, what drives flows in South Africa has not been flows that are going 
into the deposits in the banking system. So playing around with the interest rate to try and get those flows is not going to do the job. What has been driving the flows? Two things. Equities would tend to be driven by the growth, general growth in the economy, or growth in particular sectors or um, uh, particular companies. And so in 2021 and 2022, the flows into the South African equity market were predominantly into the mining yeah. uh, uh, sector because the mining sector was doing uh, that well. Bond flows are a different ballgame. The South African bond yield, 10-year bond yield, moves in sync with what the one in the US uh, moves. Mm. And the central bank does not control that yield. So that is market determined and it has tended out to be a key driver of the flows than the policy rate. Because the policy rate, as I said, it influences deposits. It not, does not drive bond flows. The bond flows are driven by the, those bond yields and the differential in those bond yields. And what you have seen had been that U.S. bond yields had gone up. As U.S. bond yields went up, our bond yields also went up because the investors would say they want to be compensated for it. Okay, so we've got five minutes left. We're going to try and cram these last two questions in. One here, and the gentleman has been waiting a very long time at the back. So here we go. Thank you, thank you Governor. Um, can I ask you about financial stability? So if we look globally, interest rates, particularly in the US, um, are getting to very interesting levels, and you know, they, they have a very large funding requirement. In your view, um, how should central bankers and monetary policy setters be thinking about the, the financial stability risks from higher interest rates globally? And then if we, make it, if we bring it back to South Africa, what's your assessment of the financial stability risk environment? Um, how are you taking it into account? We'll start with the easy one. Um, at the moment, there are no financial stability concerns in the South African uh, financial uh, sector. Um, the capital and liquidity levels are uh, adequate. Uh, the sector has got uh, very good buffers. Um, they had used the profitability of the past two years to build the, the buffers. Um, uh, interest rates have been uh, going up, and we have seen that uh, non-performing loans have also risen uh, in South Africa. Uh, but there are adequate buffers in the system to absorb those non-performing uh, loans, and so there are no financial stability concerns uh, there. But um, what is in no doubt is that um, the household sector is feeling the, is feeling the pinch, uh, and um, uh, people are struggling to service their mortgages, and we have also seen people downgrade their vehicles and so forth. Um, uh, but there aren't financial stability uh, concerns. Globally, uh, the concerns about uh, rising interest rates and raising financial stability issues had been that 60% of developing countries, according to the World Bank, 60% of the developing countries are either in debt distress or at risk of debt distress. And that is becoming a big financial, global financial stability issue if you have a default, and we have already seen Ghana had to do restructuring of their debt, Zambia had had to do the restructuring of their debt, uh, Mozambique is busy with uh, that, so you are going to be seeing those, uh, uh, those stresses. In the U.S., what you had seen as interest rates were going up was stress in the mid-sized banks uh, in the U.S., and part of it had to do with the accounting in South Africa, the way in which we account for the holdings in government bonds is we mark them to market. Whereas in the US, uh, what actually happened was that the mid-sized banks just said, no, we are holding these bonds to maturity, so we do not have to mark them uh, to market. As interest rates were going up and yields were going up and they were under pressure and they needed the liquidity, they had to go and sell those bonds and they could only sell them at a loss. And that was the story of uh, SVB and uh, two or three others uh, in the US. So you saw that, but it was not for the wide system uh, either. It didn't pose big financial stability. There were 
pockets of concerns uh, with respect to that. Final question, and in the interest of time, if I can ask you to be succinct, and Governor, succinct in your answer too. Good morning, Governor. Um, inflation targeting um, helps the poor, quite evidently, as you said. Uh, at the same time, higher interest rates does affect them uh, in the short, run, short and medium run. It feels like our monetary policy tightening is of a first world country. I mean, it's very hard not, it's very hard to ignore the fact that we have very high unemployment rates. Uh, a lot of people don't have disposable income. Is there a margin that you guys look at when considering the poor and higher interest rates or the mandate is just very strict just to keep inflation down regardless of who's affected? There is, uh, there is no doubt that um, high interest rates affect the borrowers. The unemployed that you talk about, nobody lends them money. They are unemployed. So it, the, the interest rates do not even enter the equation there for them. But inflation affects all of us. Poor, rich, inflation affects all of us. Even if you are unemployed, inflation uh, is going to affect you. So we are going to have to deal with, uh, uh, with inflation. But uh, maybe just you know, to take issue with your thing that says that uh, inflation targeting is of a, a, a first world uh, order. There are more inflation targeting countries in the developing world. Uh, they exceed the number of the developed, uh, uh, de developed countries. So, it's not that it is a, a first world uh, issue. The only thing is that we have got differing uh, inflation targets. The developed world target 2%. In South Africa, we said is 3 to 6 with a preference at 4.5. Uh, and um, uh, the Indians uh, target something like 3 to, uh, 3 to 5. And uh, the Brazilians target 3%. Uh, so you can look at the spectrum of the developing world. Actually, many of them have got inflation targets that are lower than the one that we have. We sort of, sort of look like an outlier with a wider uh, inflation, uh, inflation target compared to countries that are uh, our peers. And on that note, we are going to be wrapping things up. Before I let you go, Governor, when your contract comes up for renewal, would you like to carry on in this position if you're called on for another term? Um, I will cross that bridge when I come to it. Um, I've always been a servant of my uh, people. Um, the president is the appointing authority. The president would normally engage the board of the Reserve Bank um, ahead of the, uh, uh, of the time. Um, uh, I will consider it if uh, it, is, uh, it, is it is raised uh, uh, with me. Um, uh, this year, next year in August, I would have been in public service for 30 years. Yeah. So we will watch your next move when you get to that bridge. Thank you so much, Governor, for your time this morning. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting you. Thank you all for being with us this morning and for those of you joining us online for your time as well. From me, Alicia Sekham, it's goodbye. Do remember, you can keep this conversation going on the various social media platforms using the hashtag ThinkBigPSG.